remember um, what the Lord has done for every one of us. So uh, this is a great day that we are uh, celebrating this Good Friday, like uh, remembering the sufferings and the death and uh, of crucifixion of Jesus Christ. So uh, this evening, as we are gathering together, you know, uh, we have a guest speaker also with us. And uh, I'll be introducing uh, our dear guest speaker, Pastor Jeff, with us. And, uh, you know, when I was just thinking about um, a today's special meeting, I was just thinking, you know, we used to we used to call this program or this day as a as a Good Friday. Then I was just thinking, you know, why do we call this? Uh, I mean, Good Friday or Good Friday uh, instead of Bad Friday or Sorrowful Friday or you know the the, the suffering day or, or sad I mean Friday or something. You know, since the event is commemorating the day of suffering and the death of Jesus Christ. I mean. We know that you know there are many uh, religious and traditional or ritualistic way of observing the Good Friday. Uh, we know that some people are crying and some people are crying and uh, they are they're just carrying the the wooden cross and uh, uh, some people are going for the pilgrimage and some people are taking fasting and meditating upon the sufferings of Jesus Christ. But I was just thinking, we the born again Christians. We are commemorating or remembering the crucifixion of Jesus and his death on the cross of Calvary. What's the meaning of that calling Good Friday? So this evening we are enjoying the presence of God and we call it as a Good Friday because we are supposed to enjoy and joyfully sitting in the presence of God, remembering the death and the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Amen. So the, the, the thing is, you know, we are... Uh, enjoying in the presence of God because it's a God's plan to save his people from their sins. I mean, it's a God's plan to save his people from their sins. And we, we just remember that first we have to understand that the bad news of our condition as we were the sinful people under the condemnation. But there is a good news that is that we got the deliverance from our sinful nature. And we know that the cross is where we can see the forgiveness of Jesus Christ and the, forgive, the, the, the peace of Jesus is there, the righteousness is there, the mercy is there. So that's the reason this evening we are enjoying in the presence of God. We are not sadfully sitting in the presence of God. We are not, I mean, sorrowfully sitting in the presence of God, but we are enjoying in the presence of God because we got the forgiveness of Christ. And we got the forgiveness from all our sinful nature. And we got that mercy and we are righteous people and God has called us and God has delivered us from all kinds of the sinful nature. So that's the reason that we are sitting in the presence of God and just remembering the death and the suffering of Jesus Christ. And we are enjoying in the presence of God this evening. Uh, I would like to um, invite and welcome uh, Pastor Jeff Duncan with us this evening. So we are so glad that uh, Pastor you are with us and uh, you're going to share the word of God. And it's a great privilege to uh, have Pastor uh, Jeff Dengan with us this evening. Uh, we got a chance uh, on April 3rd, uh, two weeks ago, to visit their church in uh, Rio Linda. And uh, it's a new life church. And he's the pastor of the church. And we know that uh, uh, his father, uh, uh, Pastor James Dengan, was uh, I mean, uh, pastoring in that church, in that new life church in uh, Rio Linda. And uh, now uh, he's, uh, I think, in his 80s, and uh, he, he just uh, retired, and uh, uh, Pastor Jeff is the in charge of the church now. And it's a great privilege that uh, we are having uh, Pastor Jeff and uh, his wife also is there, I think. Um, uh, Pastor Tina, Tina Degan also is there, and we are so glad that you are with us this, this evening. And uh, let us all sit in the presence of God with a prayerful attitude just so that we'll be uh, receiving the word uh, this evening, the, the message of uh, Good Friday, the message of the uh, death of Jesus Christ. Amen. So let us all sit in the presence of God, a prayerful attitude. Let us all put our hands together and welcome uh, Pastor Jeff Dengen in our midst. Praise God. Pastor, you're mute. Pastor, we can't hear you. Um, you will have to unmute. Yeah. Look at that. Yes. The yes, only, 
the only thing my wife asked me to do before I started speaking was to unmute the the phone, right? <laughs> That's what happens when you get somebody a little bit older doing technology. Um, but welcome, welcome to New Life. It's such an honor to be here, such an honor to uh, actually be asked, a privilege to be asked to speak on this glorious occasion. Um, Pastor just spoke my sermon. Uh, it, it is a celebration. We we honor this time and we take this time in remembrance to remember what Christ has done for us on the cross. But we remember that Christ is not still on that cross. A lot of people uh, still wear the crucifix and still have um, a necklace. And a lot of them will still have Christ on that cross. But our Lord is risen. He's not on that cross. He went to that cross to, to deliver us. Today, if you'll allow me, or this evening, if you'll allow me, I'd love to take you on a little bit of a journey um, to where it started and what brought us to where we are today. Sin was the ultimate uh, reason for the cross. And we have to go all the way back to the beginning of our creation when sin entered into this world. You know, uh, we try to live a righteous life. We try to live something that's glory and holy, you know, to in man's eyes a lot of times and in and, uh, what we would call the uh, Sadducees and the Pharisees' eyes, uh, trying to live up to all these laws. And then we know that Christ came to deliver us from the, from the bondage of them laws. So today, if we go back, I'm going to take you back all the way back to uh, Genesis chapter 3, verse 15 is where our focus is going to start today. But we always know that God had intended... Um, uh, God always intended to have perfect and mutually loving relationship with his people. That's why he created Adam. That's why he created Eve, so that he could spend time with them in the garden. And it's no uh, coincidence that God made Adam and Eve. Um, and he said when he made them, it is good. This is very good. And that was in Genesis chapter 1, verse 31. He said his creation was very good. And after Anna, Adam's sin... In the Garden of Eden, everything changed. The rest of the Bible focused on what God did to reconcile the word to himself, the perfect one with man once again. The passage rises from an uh, interview in the Garden of Eden between God, Adam, and then finally the treacherous serpent. If we look at the beginning right there where man had taken of the fruit, the, the forbidden fruit, um, we see that confronted with their transgressions. You know, when we, when we make mistakes, we're confronted with it. It's not going to be something that we just get to pass by. That sin is going to, especially if you're a child of God, it's going to nag at your heart. It's going to break your heart to be out of communion with the Lord. So the, the uh, transgression that had happened, God wanted to bring back together. And we see a, a, a kind, of a, kind of how it is today in today's society. We see Adam blamed Eve. Ultimately, he put the responsibility, uh, you know, he put the responsibility on Eve. And ultimately, he put that responsibility on God himself by stating, the woman you gave me, Eve, <laughs> is the one that gave me the fruit. You know, Eve did the same thing. She rationalized uh, the serpent. Child me. The serpent tricked me into doing it. We're so quick to blame everybody else, but to take responsibility on ourselves through sin. So I want to take you back and work my way forward. Let us to the cross. What does Genesis chapter Three, verse 15 mean you'll have to bear with me as I have a little bit of a now we'll have to do this a little bit different here we see in verse 15 says that he will crush your head strike his heel God gives various judgments against those that he brought into a perfect world. 
various judgments of those that felt like was going to right by him, do right in the world. See that Jesus didn't want any part of what was happening in the garden. Adam and Eve and the serpent all face consequences of their rebellion. God says in part there was going to be enmity between the woman and the seed, and it shall bruise the head, and thou shalt bruise the hill. God's judgment came down upon the world. We see that, see if I can get this back in here. We see that God's judgment, even back then, there was mercy. God cursed the serpent. Cursed the serpent. The consequence curse. Give me one second here. Give me one second here. I am so sorry. All right. Well, that's just like Satan to fight everything that we had on there went awry. So we see that Satan was trying to, to fight from the very beginning. We see that there was, there was a separation between man and a separation between God, and he was trying to draw them back together. We know that since the beginning of time that Satan was trying to, to take and separate man and God. We know that the Bible talks about over 600 laws that was written for man to abide by. And they tried to live these laws, but they realized that they could not live the perfect life. And they had to go through a sacrifice, a sacrifice for, for man to be able to reach God, to be able to get close to God, to be able to have that communion with them once again. But we know that God's longing was always to be with man. We know that throughout the Bible, all the way from Moses, the serpent, that Satan had always tried the way what God had planted. We have to look back in the Bible. We have to realize that it's always been a fight between good and evil. There's always been something trying to separate us from the love of God. When we challenge ourselves to be close to God, Satan is going to fight. When we try to talk about the word of God, we know that there is nothing that we could do within ourselves that's going to bring us back to righteousness with God. So we need to find out exactly what it is God wants in our lives. What it is God is trying to take and put into our lives. We look in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. When we see that we're talking about a triumphant entry coming into Jerusalem. And it says that bridesmaids will be rejoicing. They'll be shouting, King of Kings and Lord of Lords is coming to redeem them because there was such a, a separation. See, the world thought that when Jesus came back to the earth, that he was going to be the king that came in on a, on a white horse and slayed the kingdoms and, and got rid of all the kings and the king's men and destroyed them and set up his throne here on earth. But Jesus didn't come in that way. Jesus came in and he picked 12 to walk with him and talk with him. All along the way, they had many miracles that had happened. Many miracles from point A to, to the cross. They saw the, the blinded eyes. 
They saw the lame walk and, and the deaf hear and the mute talk. They saw people raised from the dead. But they didn't understand that that was not why Jesus came. The miracles were a, a wonderful thing, but he kept trying to tell his disciples that there was a, another plan for him being there. That he was only going to be there with them for a while. Yet they couldn't understand. They didn't understand the purpose of God. They didn't understand the message that he was trying to, to give them. We see that the Pharisees and the Sadducees and uh, the different kings men all came against him. They were all trying to fool him and trick, them, uh, trick him. Matter of fact, the Bible said that they were called a brood of vipers. They were constantly trying to trick Jesus' words so that they can come against him and bring out against him. What they didn't realize is they couldn't take from him nothing unless he gave it to them. Jesus sat with the disciples. He washed their feet. He prayed with them. I love the story how he set he set upon this rock. He built my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And it wasn't a couple verses later. He was saying he must he had come to die. And that soon they were going to come and take him away. And Peter said, never. never, Don't talk like this. There's no way that I will allow this to happen. And what did Jesus tell him after he said, upon this church, upon this rock, I will build my church. He looked at Peter and said, get thee behind me, Satan. Because your mind doesn't understand what my heart is trying to say. You know, church, we don't understand. Why the death on the cross took place the way it did. The disciples walked with them and talked with them. He was the most intellectual person they had ever met in their life. He was one of the strongest people they had ever met in their life. His faith was unranked by anything else around him. A few more days lift him up on that cross the disciples didn't think that this could happen matter of fact none of his followers really believed the words that jesus was saying but if you remember the words we talked about zachariah zachariah chapter 9 verse 9 where he had the triumphant entry and then we see in matthew chapter 21 verse verse 5 we see that that was mentioned again. They didn't understand. They thought that this king was going to come and just tear up the world and, and set up his throne. Yet he was trying to tell them, I must go about my father's business. I must go back and do my father's work. And they, they didn't understand. Jesus told them, unless a seed falls to the ground and it dies it can't produce but if it falls to the ground through the cracks and into the into the dirt and that seed dies it produces many yet they still didn't understand we see that they were getting closer and closer and closer to the day. He had performed so many miracles and done so many great things that it was the farthest thing from their mind that they ever thought that he would be taken away, that he would be found guilty of treason for saying that he was God. They didn't understand that. They didn't understand that he said, I will die, but in three days I will rise again. 
How do you know they didn't understand, Pastor Jeff? Well, the Bible tells me that even though they didn't understand, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and those that were in Satan's fold understood. Either you're for God or you're against God. Either you understand or you don't understand. They understood so much that when they crucified Jesus, they put guards around the tomb. And it wasn't just enough to put guards around the tomb, but they put a stone in front of the tomb. And it wasn't enough that they put a stone in front of the tomb. They put a seal on that stone. The world knew something that the disciples didn't. We see a time leading up to that tomb. They found Jesus guilty. They put a crown of thorns on his head. They mocked him. They beat him. They whipped him. They took everything that was precious to us and tried to make it as ugly as they possibly could. I like what Pastor Sam was saying earlier. It goes right along with my message today. They were trying to take something that we love and make that lasting impression so that no one would ever speak the name of Jesus again because they would be so scared to talk about this man that he would be put in the grave and his memory would be put in the grave with him. So they didn't give him a quick death. Give them something that was easy, but they tortured him. And today we have to realize that there is no resurrection without that path through the cross, without the road to the cross. I would love to be able to sit here and, and paint a beautiful picture. People want to talk about Christmas and where Jesus was born. They want to talk about the resurrection. They're so quick. Put Jesus back up in heaven. That a lot of times they bypass. The very blood that was shed. For me and you and our transgressions. When. Jesus was raised up. On that cross. Everything in the disciples lives. Had to fall to their feet. How could. Such an intellectual man. With such power. And grace be taken down to the lowest form, taken down to, to something so below human should be. They didn't understand. What they didn't understand was they didn't take him down to that lowest form. Jesus freely gave it. Satan was trying to get Jesus to call down the angels. He was trying to get Jesus to call down his father and save him from what it was that he was going through. Because even Satan realized that Jesus was doing was going to give power beyond belief. The disciples were spread all about. They didn't want anybody to even know who they were. They were afraid that they would suffer the same fate that Jesus was suffering. Jesus gave himself freely. And it wasn't without anguish. It wasn't without feeling like he had been abandoned. No. 
ever in your life felt like you've been abandoned? Have you ever felt like at the deepest, darkest time in your life, nobody was there and nothing was there? Let me tell you that sometimes the darkest moments of your life is not the end of the suffering. It has to go pitch black. The veil was ripped. The skies turned black. The impossible happened. The disciples saw something that they thought would never happen. Not only was their Lord and Savior beaten and bruised beyond recognition, he died on the cross. Jesus felt like before he died that he had been rejected. He shouted out, my God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? In a contradiction statement, he said, into thy hands, I commit my spirit. Do you understand the power that I'm talking about today? What may seem like a contradiction to us is authority to him. What may seem like weakness to us and meekness is power beyond belief. You can't live unless you die. The whole message behind the cross is telling you, you have to give something up. To truly be free indeed. Jesus was setting up salvation. He had to take it to a point where he gave up everything. Bring us what we needed the most. Hallelujah. We needed to see something different. We expected power. We expected someone to reign with an iron fist, and we found meekness and love and peace. It was different. When he said a seed must die before much is gained, they didn't understand. They put Jesus on that cross. They crucified our Lord and Savior, and he died. But thank God. Thank God. That's the part that we're remembering. That through his death and crucifixion, power and strength was given. Hallelujah. You see, that's something to praise God about. That's something to get excited about. Our God, our Lord and Savior gave up. We could have freely and more abundantly. So that when we needed to go to the cross, we had an intercessor for us to take it to the Lord. No longer did we have to have sacrifices, but we could talk direct to our Heavenly Father. Almighty, Lord and Savior, Yahweh. What a wonderful, wonderful gift that was given to us at the cross. The world still wants to keep them on the cross. And, and when we talk to the world, they will not understand everything that we're trying to tell them. They'll argue with us that if he was such a great savior, if he was a Lord and King of Kings, if he was God, how did he die on a cross? But not to argue with the point, we have to take them to the cross. We need them to understand it was. Through the cross. If there was no cross, there would be no Easter Sunday. It was through the cross that there was salvation. It was through the cross that the rivers of life started flowing. It was through the cross and what seemed like a hopeless, endless cycle. It was going to continue over and over. They'd been waiting for a Savior for hundreds and hundreds of years. They'd been talking about it ever since. Genesis about a savior that was going to come and it was going to free them from the tyranny that was all around them. They didn't understand that the only way that that was going to happen for them to truly be free, free, <laughs> was through the cross. 
Jesus came and he died for our sins to the cross. So many times we want to bypass the cross. We admit that it happened. We're in such a hurry to get to the resurrection that we forget the significance of the cross. It was through crucifixion, through his death, that true freedom happened. That true freedom came into our lives. Are you free today? Are you truly free today? I was watching earlier as, as these young people were, were play, uh, playing on stage and singing gospel music, singing songs about resurrection, singing about hope and freedom. Listening to the beatbox that they were, they were hitting on, it sounded like, and it wasn't in the screen, but I can envision it's one of my favorite instruments and, and just the freedom of being able to, to hit that, just to, just to shout out with, with your hands or with your voice or with your body that I am free to praise, I am free to worship, I am free to love. They didn't understand that on the day of the crucifixion. They didn't understand that the day Jesus died. Matter of fact, some of them started walking home with their heads hanging low. They didn't understand that Jesus was coming back again. He talked about it, but they didn't grasp it. All they saw was the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, someone that could do no wrong, someone that couldn't suffer pain at the hands of man. He was beyond that. He'd be able to raise himself from the dead if it happened on the same day in the same moment. He can call down 10,000 angels. They didn't see that he was doing what he had to do for them, for them. Are you willing to die and give up what's inside of you to truly live? We have to die to ourselves. We have to die to the sins of this world. We have to die to our habits. We have to die to our addictions. We have to die to the strongholds that this world has put in our lives. So as we're remembering the cross, we need to remember that something was given up. We could live. Every time you want to reach a new level with Jesus, you have to give something up. (laughs) Hallelujah. You have to give something up to live. Jesus freely gave his life so that we could live. Live life and live it more abundantly. All of the disciples, after Jesus died, all of them except one, was murdered, was killed in the name of the Lord. You see, the world thinks. I get excited about talking about the word of God. The world thinks that if they if they stymie us or they they kill us or, or what they think is silencing us, that it'll all go away. But what ended up happening is by by murdering those that they thought would stop the word of the God, it actually started spreading more. They thought if they could take the people that that believed that Jesus died and rose again, if they could crucify them, if they can murder them, if they can stone them, if they can take their voice away, would take church away. But all it did was make people more bold. What happened with disciples after Jesus died, they became bold and willing to go out and preach the gospel. They got it. They got it. Jesus had to die so they could live. So they were willing to die so the next generation could live. They were giving up their self. They were giving up the flesh. They were giving up the things that were strongholds in their life so they can live freely. Because they finally understood that he that the son of set free is free indeed. Hallelujah. Good Friday. Let's 
on the cross. It's on the cross. Let that blood flow through our veins. Died so that we can live. Are you living today? Is this just the day that you want to remember that Jesus died on a cross and Sunday's on its way? Or do you really want to dig in? <laughs> Find out what Good Friday is all about. I agree with you. Why do they call it Good Friday? It's Sad Friday. Hurtful Friday. It's Aggravating Friday. It's, it's the Friday that they, they did something so gruesome to the one I love the most. Good Friday, because without what happened, without what they did, without them trying to silence, without Satan trying to silence my Lord and Savior, there wouldn't have been salvation. There wouldn't have been Easter. There wouldn't have been resurrection. There wouldn't have been the church of God. There wouldn't have been churches and freedom. There wouldn't have been the day of Pentecost, people speaking in tongues. Friday. It's truly Friday. Amen. It's something to praise God about. We have our Lord and Savior, our Redeemer. Our Redeemer lives. The cross was just a place to rest. What was the true outcome? Life forever. Freedom forever. Don't be afraid of this world coming against you. Our Savior reigns. Our Savior lives. Our God is good. Our God is good. And his mercy, His mercy, His love, His grace. We have a redeeming power. Our Redeemer lives. Amen. I challenge you today to lift up your head. Tell somebody about the good news of Jesus Christ. That he came and he died. But he rose again. He rose again. Without the death, there was no resurrection. Without us dying, we can't rise. We have to die to rise above. I pray that the words of Good Friday have reached your heart. I pray that you realize we had to go back to the beginning. We had to go back to the prophecies. In Genesis, first messianic words that came out. Zechariah talked about the king coming in. Now it was all fulfilled. Talk about it in Matthew chapter 21, verses 5. Our Lord reigns. He died on the cross so that we may be free indeed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let me pray with you, and then I'm going to turn it back over to, to Pastor Sam. If there's anybody that's out there that hasn't truly given your life to God, maybe you have a stronghold that's in your life that you haven't given over to the Lord. Maybe there's something in your life that has, that has taken over or you've let creep in. You need to get rid of that today. You need to let it die. You need to let that die so freedom can reign in your life. I challenge you right now to turn it over to Jesus. Dear Heavenly Father, God, I pray today that you touch those that are under the sound of my voice. That you give them a freedom, God, that you've never given them before. Holy Spirit, that you reign in their lives. That your power just, just saturates their life right now, God. That they can... Get rid of them strongholds, God. They can let them die so they can live more abundantly. And let us die to this world every day so that we can live for you more and more every day. Let us constantly be giving up the things of this world so we constantly be getting closer to you. God, if there's anybody out there in the sound of my voice that needs to walk closer with you, that needs salvation day, that needs to accept you as their Lord and Savior, I pray right now, God, that you give them the strength to say, Lord Jesus, I 
I believe in you. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe you rose again. You're on the right hand side of the Father, God. And I believe that my sins are forgiven. God, forgive me of each one of my sins. God, every, every time I transgress, God, I, I pray that you take that away from me so that I can live free forevermore. Take away my shame and take away my guilt because I know that that's not of you. Jesus, I love you. I accept you in my heart today. I accept you in my heart to stay. Be with me from this day forward, I ask in your holy and blessed name. Amen. Amen. Remember, there is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. He went to the cross so that we can be free indeed. Amen. Pastor Sam, I'm going to turn it back over to you.